chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. <laughs> I'm thankful for all of our all of our substitutes and our fillings. Did everybody get a paper? No? Roger. Roger failed. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna excommunicate Roger. He he asked me before church, you want me to pass out them papers? I said yes. He didn't pass out a one. All right. All right. If you want one, he's coming around. He'll get you one. And while he's coming, I'll uh, I'll give you a praise real quick as well. But I was like I was saying, I was thankful for all the uh, all of our substitutes and our fill-ins this morning. We had many positions that people were out, and uh, people just jumped right up to the plate and helped and stepped up, and we're thankful for that. It's good to see Ben up here singing. I thought that was great. <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll conjure him into it again one of these days and get him up here. But uh, he uh, he was willing. So, but he did a good job. So. Um, anyway, so if you're ever asked to fill in, you say yes, it is a blessing for sure. If you say no, God will get you. But uh, I'm kidding, but uh, amen. It's always a blessing to serve the Lord together. So we're going to conclude tonight. That's a big word, that means finish. Uh, we're going to finish our series tonight on claiming our Canaan. We've kind of gone through the book of Joshua, not verse by verse, not even every chapter, but we've took out some, uh, taken out some very big events that took place uh, during that time. And so we're going to close tonight with uh, chapter 23, a little bit of chapter 24. And as we uh, continue thinking about claiming our Canaan, the victorious Christian life here on earth, while we live, while we're waiting for the promised land, uh, we want to close with this topic of an old soldier prepares to break camp. And this is Joshua here. Um, Verse 1 in our text when we get there uh, kind of tells the story. Joshua uh, is there. Israel had acquired the land that God had promised them since, you know, Abraham. They're finally there. They're in. Their faithful leader, Joshua, is now old. Do you feel his pain? <laughs> Amen. He is old. Uh, he is preparing really, really to die. Verse number 14 kind of talks about that. But before he leaves them, he has something he wants to tell them in the area of their service for the Lord. Uh, so to do this, he calls two meetings. Uh, in chapter 23, uh, he holds a meeting with the elders and the leaders of the people. Chapter 24, he gets all the people of Israel together and has another meeting with them. Uh, and Joshua is this faithful old soldier. Uh, this faithful old man of God, this, this uh, man who God has uh, used to do great things for Israel as he took over for Moses. And he's preparing now to leave the nation of Israel as their leader uh, and uh, uh, looking, looking forward to his eternal home, if you will, during this particular chapter here. Uh, but uh, he knows that uh, he has seen, as the people there have, uh, God do so many great things. He saw him brought him out of bondage. He, he saw him uh, safely lead him across the wilderness, part the Red Sea, part the Jordan. All the miracles that they witnessed. Joshua was a part of that. But Joshua was smart enough as a leader to know this. There was a generation following him that didn't see those things. Uh, that didn't see the Red Sea part. They didn't know, hey, we were in bondage for all those years and God gave us man. They, they didn't see all that stuff. And Joshua knew this as a leader, so he calls these people together to say, hey, I want to remind you of some things. You need to stay faithful to God because God stayed faithful to us. And, and so he does a great job, I think, in the closing of his leadership uh, to just say, I'm going to give you some, some thoughts and some teaching and some lessons to help you stay close to God, serve God, and remember what God has done. And as we look at these things tonight, again, they're, they're great parallels for us tonight. Uh, they're, they're very helpful for us to be able to look at tonight and realize uh, we have to keep God's work alive. And if we're not careful, even as a church, uh, there's a generation coming. And I'll be honest with you, there's a generation coming that has not seen the miracles of God that we've seen. Have not experienced the power of answered prayer like we have. Uh, well, that's the old, that's for the old people. And so a younger generation is being brought up, not being taught and not seeing the, the, uh, the obligation, if you will, to pray and then to watch God answer prayer and to be thankful for it. They're missing it. And so Joshua knew this back in Israel's day, so he covers a few things. And I want to cover them with us tonight to kind of help us to remind, eventually, you're going to be the old soldier. Okay? Eventually, I'm going to be the old soldier. And, and we're going to break camp with our fellows here on earth, and we're going to go to our promised land Who's going who's gonna to pick up the mantle? 
Uh, what, what's the next generation going to do for the cause of Christ? And so I want to challenge us tonight, uh, the Sunday night crowd, just to remind ourselves of some things that will help us move forward and continue to serve God uh, for many, many, many years to come and hopefully prepare the next generation to do so as well. All right? So we're going to be in Joshua 23. If you have found that, go ahead and stand with me. We'll read the first eight verses. We'll read some more scripture as we go through the outline and get into some of the points. But let's pick up verse number one here. We'll read the first eight verses, and I'll pray, and you can be seated. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was waxed old and stricken in age. Isn't that a nice way to say it? He waxed old and stricken in age. <laughs> That's like flowery and, you know, nice. He's an old dude. He's, he's, uh, he's no geezer. Let's just put it that way, all right? He, he's, he's at the end of his life, and we know that. He's what? Circling the drain. There you go. <laughs> the, Bible's, the Bible's wording is a little bit more, better than that, isn't it? Uh, and Joshua called for all Israel and for the elders and for the heads and for the judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. That ye come not among these nations, that uh, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and goodness and the time we've had in your house. And uh, we're thankful for a couple of our missionaries we've heard from this evening. Lord, and the good reports there and the work being done. And uh, we're thankful for praise time as well, Lord, as we've been able just to uh, thank you for answered prayer and thank you for uh, healings and thank you for just the, 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 the daily work that you do in our lives, Lord. We're so grateful for that. And we ask you now as we open your word, we pray that you'll bless now this time of teaching and preaching. Uh, use it in our lives to challenge us one more time from the book of Joshua as we think about the next generation, Lord, and our responsibility to them and our responsibility to you, even as we are uh, getting older and, and stricken in age, Lord. I pray that we can apply these truths to help us us as we try to still live for you and uh, spread uh, the good news of the gospel of Christ here on earth, we pray. We love you again. We thank you for all you've done now. Bless this time. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As Joshua prepares to break camp, if you will, uh, he gives us some thoughts, and I want to look at those tonight. And uh, the first thing I see in those first few verses is Joshua's concern. Uh, Joshua's concern. The, the neat thing about Joshua is this. He saw all the miracles, okay? He went in as a spy. When the other ten said no, he said yes. Uh, he enters the promised land. He takes over for Moses. He becomes the leader. He sees all the enemies being dispelled from the promised land. He goes through all this, and now he's at the end of his life. They've had a little bit of time of rest. Uh, some of the enemies have been uh, dispelled. They passed out the land to the tribes that, that, that it was due and all that. And now they're kind of resting, but Joshua realizes my time's about done. And instead of just saying, see ya, Joshua says, I want, to, I want one last opportunity to share some things with you. And we see a, a concerned Joshua, I think, in these, uh, this passage. Uh, Joshua, again, nearing his departure, uh, he, he wants to challenge the people of Israel one last time. He sees some things that maybe are starting to turn into things he doesn't like. So what does he do? He takes the one last opportunity to try to correct those things and try to keep them on the straight path like any good leader would do, try to keep them living for God. Uh, you know, we, we, we have the same thing today, man. The pastor doesn't preach on sin because he wants to butt into your business. He doesn't preach on sin because he's against you. He, the, the, the pastor should preach on sin because he loves you and wants you to be the best Christian you can be. Amen? And that's kind of what we see from Joshua here in this passage of Scripture. He's not butting in at the end of his life. He's not, well, you're a bunch of buzzards and I'm the only thing that kept you doing right. He's saying, listen, there are some things that I'm seeing as the generations are changing, and I want to nip those things in the bud, and I want to make sure we continue to serve God as a nation of Israel. Uh, so Joshua's concern, and I see three fears that he brings out in these first few verses that we read. The first one I see in verse number six, he fears complacency. He fears complacency. He's afraid that the people of Israel might begin to take the law of God for granted. 
Uh, he, he, he fears that they might become complacent in their walk with the Lord. Complacent in their status and in their relationship with their God. Now, I hate to say it, but he was right. Because as you continue to read about the nation of Israel, you see he was exactly right to be concerned for this because it's exactly what they did. Uh, he feared their complacency. Uh, sin, uh, it, it, sin is sin no matter what it is. And I'm going to just say this. I think complacency is a very big sin. And I think the sin of complacency leads us to, uh, into many other sins that we might not realize that the two are connected. Uh, complacency, it's one of the most common sins. We allow ourselves, like Revelation talks about, to adopt the Laodicean philosophy and attitude. Oh, uh, well, we'll just go with the flow. Oh, we don't, we don't want to be too on fire, but we don't want to be cold. We'll just walk in the middle of the road. Complacency. Complacency. We've allowed ourselves many times to get satisfied with our spiritual condition. I've been walking with the Lord this long, and this is where I don't ever be satisfied with your spiritual condition. We should always be moving forward. We should always be growing. And Joshua's uh, got a concern about this with the nation of Israel. You say, what, what's, the, what's the thing with Laodicea? Well, you think about Laodicea, uh, if, you, if you study them out a little bit, um, they had uh, cold water piped down from the mountains of Colossae. They had hot water piped in from Heropolis. By the time each one of those waters reached Laodicea, they were both neither cold nor hot. They were both lukewarm. And that's where that philosophy and that thought of, of lukewarmness comes from. And what does the Bible tell us about lukewarmness? God says, I'd rather you be cold than to be lukewarm. <laughs> but, but that's the problem in much of our Christianity. This is the problem in many of our churches today. We've gotten complacent. Well, God used to do these things, and we saw those miracles. And he, but, but, you know, it's a different time. It's a different generation. It's the same God. Amen? Complacency. Don't get to the point where uh, you feel like, man, I've arrived, or I'm okay. I'll just stay where I'm at. Continue to strive to grow your relationship with the Lord. Continue to learn how, what are ways that I can serve Him better now. How can I get more involved even now in my older years, even than when I was young? What can I do for Christ? Uh, the, uh, don't, don't get in the complacency attitude. That was Joshua's concern in verse number 6. Verse number 7, he feared compromise. He feared compromise. He, he, he warns the people, he said, there's going to be some enemies still around. And when I'm dead and gone, uh, God is still on the throne. But don't you intermingle with those people. Don't you begin worshiping their gods. Don't you begin serving their gods. Don't you enter into relationships with them in the future because uh, bad things will happen. Now, can I ask you this question? What did they do? Exactly that. <laughs> so his fears are very relevant. By the way, his, this is not fear, worry, and chewing my fingernails. He's saying, I've got some legitimate concerns, and we know they're legitimate because they, they fall into each of these. They got complacent. They began to compromise. Can I just say this? With complacency, a problem of many of our churches today is compromise. How do we fit in with the world? How do we, how do we draw the world, uh, and many churches today have begun to act like the world, to bring in the world? The problem is this. When you bring in the world into the church, you got to keep the church in the world. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. And, and so we begin compromising beliefs and compromising morals and compromising standards and compromising uh, the religious system, if you will, compromising doctrine. Why? To reach people. Uh, you know, the gospel can reach people all, all in and of itself, okay? Uh, we just need to preach Jesus. <laughs> that's, all, that's, all, that's all it is. Uh, but we, he, he feared compromise. And many times, unfortunately, we are, we are guilty of this as well. We may not bow down and worship a, 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 an image of stone. But how many times in our lives have we have allowed other things to become more important than God? You know, materials, things, possessions, money, people, uh, jobs. You fill in the blank. Uh, we've done it. We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. But we don't live that way with our lives. Compromise. Joshua was concerned. Israel fell into the trap later on. We see that. Uh, and, and I want us just to know today, as we prepare to, to pass off the scene as the older generation of Christians, we've got to prepare the, the generation's following to realize it's not time to compromise. It's time to, 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 to keep on charging hell with the squirt gun. Amen. It's time to keep on living for Christ and standing for right. Don't compromise. Joshua was concerned about this as he's ending up his, his, his leadership there for Israel. Verse number 8, he gives us one more area of concern. He says, but cleave unto the Lord your God as you've done to this day. He fears commitment. He doesn't fear them being committed. He fears them stopping their commitment. Uh, he, he, he fears that they will stop being committed to the Lord they've been committed to up to this point. They would become slack and not cleave to the Lord. Uh, once again, we see from the nation of Israel what happened. That's exactly what they did. <laughs> so Joshua's concerns were, were very relevant. 
Uh, he's very wise as a, as a spiritual leader for Israel. He calls out three distinct things and says, be careful. And what happens? They do them. They do them. He knew what he was talking about. Uh, these other areas we had mentioned, uh, complacency and compromise. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it tonight as well. I know it's a Sunday night crowd, but unfortunately many of our churches, they struggle with commitment. We, we do things halfway. Uh, we serve God for one minute and stop the next. Uh, we, we don't want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, but we want to be on board the train to heaven. Amen? <laughs> you know what Jesus says is this. If you don't hate your mom and hate your dad and hate your brother and hate your sister and hate your friends and hate your spouse and love me, you ain't worthy of me. That's what Jesus says. If you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. Now again, that's not literal hate. We know that. We're talking about our love for others paling in comparison to our love for him. He says, you're not worthy. That's total commitment. That's total commitment. Uh, very clearly, Jesus says, I deserve first place. I deserve first place. Am I willing to give him total commitment? Holding nothing back. Making sure I'm his completely. Joshua's concern was very valid. And as he's passing off the scene, he makes this known to the leaders. He says, guys, God's been good to us. God's been faithful. We've seen answered prayer. We've seen the promises of God. We've seen deliverance. We've seen miracles. We've seen God's power. Don't you, don't you turn all that around. Don't you go back to your old ways. Unfortunately, they didn't listen too well, did they? <laughs> they didn't listen too well. Joshua's concern. Number two, I'll show this to you here. I, I want to give you... Um, you can write it down, we'll come to it in a minute. But I want to show you Joshua's challenge. Joshua's challenge. As you pick up the rest of, uh, of chapter 23, and then you get into chapter 24, we'll read a few verses as well. I want to show you what he, what he says to the nation of Israel. He says, here's my concerns. Now let me challenge on what to do. Look at verse number 9. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves, that ye love the Lord your God. Starting out pretty good, huh? Look at verse 12. Else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of those nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off the earth, uh, until you perish from off this good land, I'm sorry, which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going uh, the way of all the earth, and ye know in your hearts and in your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. God's been faithful. God's kept all of his promises. Remember that. Therefore it shall come to pass, as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things, until he have destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land, which he hath given you. Unto you. You go into chapter 24 and you read about the first uh, 13 verses or so. He gathers all the tribes of Israel together in Shechem. We see in verse number one, he gets their judges and their officers. And in verse 2 through 13, he just simply, he just simply spends some minutes and he, and he just tells them this. You remember how good God's been all the way dating back to Abraham, to Moses, uh, to traveling through the wilderness, all the blessings, all the victories, all the miracles. That's what he reminds them for 12 verses, okay? Then they pick up verse number 14. After he's reminded them of all that, in those, those 12 verses or so, he says this. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. Awesome. Look what the people say. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. They're with him. Yes, let's do this, right? Now we know the end of the story, right? <laughs> They're with him here. Verse 17. 
For Lord our God, he it is that brought us up of our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will also we serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. The people said unto Joshua, Nay, uh-uh, we will serve the Lord. It sounds good, doesn't it? They're with him. Again, we know the end of the story. <laughs> and Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you, uh, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your hearts unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and his voice will we obey. That's a great, great, great promise from them. Amen? Now we know they don't do it. <laughs> we know they don't live up to the promise, but at least they're with him uh, for him to feel as he's, as he's passing off the scene. Joshua's challenge uh, he gets the elders and the people together, and he says, we remember how God has done all these things for us. There are some truths and some, some powerful things from God that I want to remind you of and challenge you to look back upon to help you to consider every day of your life so that you continue to live the right type of life. If you think about this, if you, if you remember God's victory from the past, it helps you to deal with today's current struggles knowing I can get victory again. He was faithful then, he's faithful today. And so Joshua's kind of reminding of this. Remember all the promises, remember all the miracles, remember all the blessings. He still has that for you, but you got to keep serving him. you got to keep serving him. Uh, he gives them a couple things as a challenge. And the first thing he tells them to consider in, in, in verse 9 through 16 that we read, finishing up chapter 23, he reminds them to consider God's wrath. He says, God was good to you in blessings, but let me tell you something. You turn on God, he's going to be bad to you in cursings. He, he's going he's to punish you. He's going to chasten you. He's going to whoop you. Uh, and that's the primary idea he's trying to convey. If you serve the Lord, he'll bless you. If you disobey him, he will chastise you. We know the same principle is true today, right? Uh, Israel, Israel responded with, we will, we will, we will, kind of showing their love for the Lord. Uh, the admonition is still with us today. Serve the Lord, you're blessed. Disobey the Lord, you're chastened. Amen? Same, same principle still applies today, uh, still lives in our lives today, still a part of our lives today. The choice is entirely ours to make. Here's what we need to understand. How I live my life, I really believe, truly shows the heart of love that I have for my Savior. If I want to live in that time of disobedience and to suffer the chastening of God, I can't say that I love God like I say I love God. If I truly love God, my heart uh, will then be revealed by my lifestyle. We, we know that. Everything starts here. Uh, and so uh, consider God's wrath. The church at Ephesus had many, many commendable traits in Revelation chapter 2. But what they lack? A deep love for Jesus. A deep love for Jesus. A life lived for Christ reveals a heart that's in love with Christ. Uh, and so he's reminding, he's challenging this. You better consider the chastening of the Lord. The second thing he tells them to consider in the first 13 verses or so of, of chapter 24 is God's works. God's works. He reminds them again of uh, how God had blessed the nation, how he'd brought them out of bondage, how he'd helped them with all their problems, how he'd uh, done miraculous things and protecting them and providing for them. And he had been faithful to them over all these years. And he reminds them of that. He says, don't forget about those things. Remember that. Remember that. You know, what a great motivator for serving Christ. Remembering what he's done for us all the, all the days of our life. You know, if you truly stop and think about the day you got saved... You didn't deserve that. The change that he's made in your life because of salvation, we don't deserve that. And if we would truly use that to motivate us, it would cause us to want to serve him more and to serve him better and to be totally committed to him like we talked about a little while ago. Consider God's works. Uh, he, he adopted us into his, uh, his family. He saved us. He changed us. He gave us a, a new name written down in glory. Amen. Uh, he, he put our feet on a solid rock. We joined a new family. He, he blotted out our sins. Uh, think about all that he's done for us. And then on top of salvation, how he continues to bless us in our daily lives. And we still don't deserve it. Consider God's works. The greatness and the goodness of God towards us. It's a, it's a motivator. To remind me daily to renew and to improve my relationship with him. 
Joshua challenges the people. Remember God's wrath. Remember God's works. Those last few verses that we read from chapter 24, uh, uh, we, we see the, he, he challenges them to consider God's will. Consider God's will. He tells the people, it's the Lord's will. You clean up your life and you serve me faithfully. You don't worship other gods and you stay close to me. And he says in verse number 15, that's exactly what me and my family are going to do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Of course, the nation of Israel responds, we will too, we will too, we will too, right? And we know it doesn't happen, but they respond that way. I want to just challenge you tonight. Uh, talking about serving the Lord, talking about obeying the will of God is a wonderful thing. Doing it is a completely different creature. Doing it is completely different. Uh, you know, he, he wants you to search in your life and search in your heart and, and destroy those things that are me, me, me instead of him, him, him. What can I take out of my life and replace with, with what God would have me to do? Joshua's attitude is very simple. As for me and my house, I don't care what you do. We will serve the Lord. Too many Christians are waiting on somebody else to do something before they do something. Too many churches are, well, that church will do it, I'll do it. Uh, too many wives and husbands are, well, they'll do it, I'll do it. No, 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 no. As for me, I will serve the Lord. I don't care what society does. I don't care what government does. I don't care what other churches do. I don't care what other people do. I will serve the Lord because that's what God's will is for my life. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. And so he challenges them to consider that. The very last few verses that we read, 19 through 24, he gives them one last challenge, and he, can, he challenges them to consider God's witness. Joshua makes a strange statement to the people. He tells them, you can't serve the Lord. That's what he said uh, in verse number uh, 19. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is holy and he is jealous. Now, wait a minute. You just spent like 40 verses telling us to serve the Lord, right? Go, span over two chapters, you just told us, and now you tell us we can't serve the Lord. His meaning, though, is pretty clear. He's reminding them this. The Lord witnesses your life, and you can't have things both ways. You can't serve the Lord and live in sin. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You can't serve the Lord on one hand and, 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 and then serve false gods on the other hand. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, he's reminding them that judgment will accompany such an action. And the people, of course, proclaim again, yes, 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 we, we got it. We'll, we'll do that. Can I remind you today, I know it's 2024, a different time in Israel's history, but can I remind you that the same God watches our lives today and witnesses our lives today? And we can, we can tell everybody in the church, oh, yeah, I love God. I'm serving God. Oh, he's got all of me. And if our life before God does not show that, God knows. God knows. It's easy to fool people. We can't fool God. We're either serving the Lord with commitment or we're dealing with some hypocrisy in our life. Uh, Israel, uh, we're many times uh, uh, like we are today, like Elijah's day, walking the fence. I want to say I'm devoted to God, but I still want to have one foot in the world. I, 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 I want to do this, but I still want to do this. There's, there's, only one, there's, only, there's only one will we can follow. You can't serve two masters. And so he challenged them to realize God's watching. And I know that's something we tell our kids. You know, God's watching you. But God's watching. God knows. He sees the good and the bad. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows our reasoning. Consider God's witness. He challenges them in that area. I want to give you one last thought here as he passes off the scene. Uh, we, we see his concerns. Very legitimate. Very real. We see his, his challenge to the people in dealing with some of those things. And the last thing you see is Joshua's covenant. Joshua's covenant. Uh, pick up at verse 25 there at the end of chapter 24. We'll, we'll finish up the chapter here. Actually, pick up in verse 27. Did I, I say there it is. Okay. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Uh, so Joshua let the people depart, every man to his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath-Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill 
of Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. And which had known all the works of the Lord. You paying attention? That he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt. Buried they in Shechem. Uh, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor. The father of Shechem. For a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer the son of Aaron died. And they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas. His son which was given him in Mount Ephraim. I think there's a really important phrase here. We're going, to look at, we're going to look at Joshua's covenant here, okay? I think there's an important phrase in uh, verse number 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord uh, that he had done for Israel. Remember I talked about Joshua's concern? There's a generation coming that didn't see God work. They may hear stories. Grandpa might tell them, but they didn't see it. In Israel, the Bible says in verse 31, serve God as long as Joshua was alive. Serve God as long as, uh, until the bones of Joseph were buried. Serve God until Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the high priest, was buried, was di died and buried. And now we know what happened. What happened? They went back to their old sinful ways. As long as the men of God were on the scene, they were okay. And so Joshua concludes uh, his leadership here of Israel, and he makes a covenant with Israel, starting in verse number 25. And I want to look at that covenant, first of all. Uh, first, it involved a great stone. Before he dies, he puts a great stone monument to the fact that the people promised to follow the Lord. He says, when you see this stone, you're going to be reminded that God was good, that God was faithful, and you promised to stay faithful to him uh, every day of your life. Every time you pass it, you're going to remember the oath that you made to follow the Lord. Now, we don't necessarily... You know, put stones out in our yard every time we make a decision for Christ, okay? But there have been times in every one of our lives where we made a great decision for Christ. I'm going to do this. And God, if you'll allow me, and if you'll allow me to change, if you'll help me in this area, I'm going to make a commitment to you in this area. We've done that since we were, uh, you know, young people as teenagers in church. Uh, we got saved. We began to faithfully serve him. We started along the way making commitments. I'm going to do this. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give to faith promise. I'm going to serve in Sunday school. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And we've made these commitments to God along the, the, the steps of our life. You know, Ecclesiastes reminds us of an important truth. And it reminds us that it's better to not make a commitment to God than to make it and then break it. Right? So we, again, we don't set up stones in our lives and say, hey, here's major decisions I made for Christ. But we know, we know the decisions we've made for Christ. Can I ask you today, are we following through with the decisions that we've made? Are we truly uh, following through with, with the things that God has laid on our heart and the commitments that we've made for him? Now, we mess up from time to time. I get that. I'm glad, I'm glad the horse can still be ridden, ridden though, right? You can get back up on it and go again. Amen. <laughs> Uh, it involved a gray stone. He says this, every time you see that stone, you're going to remember you made a commitment to God. Christian, remember, remember the decisions you made for Christ. Remember the commitments you've made. Maybe you find yourself today wandering away from commitments that you've made. Get, get back at them. Get back at them. Make that covenant with God again. It involved a great stone. And then lastly, you see this letter B, it involves some gravestones. It involves some gravestones. This book closes with Three funerals. These three funerals, I believe, have an impact and a meaning and can speak to us today. The first thing you see in verse 29 uh, through 31, you see the gravestone of faithfulness. The first gravestone that is mentioned is that of Joshua. His tombstone reminds us as he closes his leadership of Israel of the faithfulness of God to his people. God had used Joshua to bring the people to the promised land. He'd used Joshua to help the people get on the right path and stay on the right path. And, and through the life of Joshua, God proved himself over and over and over to be a faithful and a good God. Those who serve the Lord learn the truth very quickly that God is faithful. That God keeps his promises. That God is worthy to be, to, to be serving. He keeps his word. He fulfills his promises. He's always faithful. If I'll serve him, he'll bless me. We know that in scripture. Uh, if I turn my life to him, he, he, he comes to me running uh, as a faithful, good God. The gravestone of faithfulness. This is the covenant he's making. With, with my gravestone, I want you to remember one thing. God is faithful. God is faithful. You want to keep serving God today in, in our, in our well-stricken years? 
I'll be flowery like the Bible. <laughs> when you're stricken in age, you want to stay faithful to God? You want to keep serving Him? Remember His faithfulness over the years. That's the first reminder He gives them through His own gravestone. God's been faithful. God's been faithful. The second gravestone you see is the gravestone of fulfillment. The gravestone of fulfillment. Verse number 32 the second gravestone mentions uh, belonged to a man who had died centuries before they'd gotten to the promised land. He actually died in the land of Egypt. His name was Joseph. And on Joseph's deathbed, he made a prediction. His prediction was this. That promised land that God promised Abraham, y'all are going to get. And when you get there, don't you leave me here to rot in Egypt. You dig up my bones and you bring them with you. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now, I want you to think about this for just a minute, okay? They don't have the preservation processes that we have today in place. Okay? Can you imagine when they left, Israel, or left Egypt and they traveled across the wilderness, got to the promised land, turned around had to wander another 40? Can you imagine that that whole time they're carrying around the bones of a dead man? <laughs> Think about that for just a minute. They're carrying around a dead man that entire time. Why? Because he said, I'm not staying in Egypt. You take me to the promised land. And so they brought him with him. And of course, we see in verse number 32, several hundred years later, a grave is dug. If they had a coffin, I don't know exactly how it worked in those days, or they wrapped him, whatever they did. It was lowered into the body, and a, and a gravestone was put in place. I can almost imagine Joseph in his bones, in his dead, decomposing state. You could hear a whisper as they laid him into the grave. I told you so. <laughs> I told you so, you know. Uh, but anyways, the lesson here is this. If God's able to make a promise to us, God's able to keep the promise. And, and, and Joseph said, listen, God promised you the land. I know he's going to keep the promise. Take me with you. Bury me there. Fulfillment. Doesn't God always keep his word? Isn't that, isn't that encouraging? Doesn't God always take care of his children? That's a wonderful truth tonight. The gravestone of faith, of fulfillment. The gravestone of faithfulness. I'm thankful that God, as long as I serve him, I can count on him blessing me. I can count on his protection, his provision in my life. The gravestone of fulfillment. Here's, here's what you're going to learn real quick. And many of you probably already know this because you are well stricken in years. When you serve God faithfully, it's fulfilling. You're not always looking for the next high, the next, the next uh, pleasure, the next this, the next that. You are, you are satisfied with Christ. That's the gravestone that, that, that we see with Joseph that set up as, Joseph, as Joshua was making this covenant with the people at the end of his life. One last gravestone, you see this in verse number 33. You see the gravestone of finality. This last gravestone marks the grave of a man by the name of Eliezer. Eliezer was the son of Aaron, who was the first high priest of Israel. His grave is the grave of finality. The death of Eliezer really marked the changing of the guard in Israel. He was, like, he was like the death that said, okay, all the old timers are gone. The next generation is on the scene. The next generation is here. Uh, the ones who came out of Egypt and wandered the wilderness, they're gone. Uh, they're all dead and gone now. Of course, most of you know, the men that, that didn't go in those 20, they all died anyway. Now the last of those who were faithful have passed off the scene. All that God used in a mighty way are gone. All those that witnessed the, the miracles and the mightiness of God are, are gone. A new generation now has to pick up the mantle of service and do something for the Lord. Now, we might be tempted to say, you know what? It's a shame when the old soldiers of Jesus pass off the scene. It's not a shame for them. They enjoy heaven. Amen? <laughs> the shame is when those who are left behind don't pick up the mantle of the, mans, of the men and the ladies of God who went on before and continue serving God. The shame is when we leave the next generation away from God instead of bringing them to God. The shame is when uh, me and my house will serve the Lord, but I won't pass it down to my children. I won't pass it down to my grandchildren. And before long, we're going to have a, a generation in America that there is no church. That's, 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 that's the way things will head if we aren't very careful uh, and, and, and serving God and teaching the next generation to do the same and staying faithful. You know, I, I think about Elijah. And when Elijah passed off the scene, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm thankful that there was an Elisha standing by. All right? Picked up the mantle, did twice as much as Elijah did, saw the power of God. Thankful for that, right? 
And we can go through, we can go through the Bible and give you other illustration after illustration of somebody who was in the wings waiting. And when that other man passed off the scene, they, they took off and began to serve Christ. You know, if you think about that, we have the same God. He did it for Elijah. I think he can do it for us. We've got to prepare the next generation. Uh, with, our, with our lives and our faithfulness and our testimony, with our consistency, with our, with our lifestyle, uh, but also with our teaching. And, and teach the next generation that serving God is not a burdensome thing. Serving God is not a, a boring, oh, I got to do. It's a privilege and an honor to serve the King of Kings. We need some Elishas that will pick up the mantle and serve God. Uh, we need some that are willing to pay the sacrifice that's required to serve God and be fully committed to Him. Uh, many of our forefathers, if you will, that we know, older generations have died and gone to heaven. And now we're on the scene holding the mantle and, and holding the torch, right? But I got news for you. We all ain't going to live forever. And some of you are getting really close. I'm kidding. I'm just, just reminding you, all right? I'm just teasing. Every day we live, one day closer <laughs> to heaven, Amen. Are we training the next generation by our faithfulness as an example, but then teaching them to be faithful so that when we all pass off the scene, there's still a generation of Christians that are faithfully serving God and remember his promises and his goodness and his blessings and all the miracles that he's done for us in our lives. D.L. Moody said this. Uh, somebody told him once, the world has yet to see what God can do with a life totally surrendered to him. And D.L. Moody said, I want to be that man. I want to be that man. And of course, God used D.L. Moody to shake two continents for Christ. God is looking for people today that will say, I'll, I'll be that man. I'll be that man. I'll be that woman. I'll be that Christian. I'll serve God faithfully. And I may be well stricken in years, but can I just say this, folks? Listen, I don't care how old you are. There's still ways that you can serve God. And, and the, this, a lot of our churches today, the older generation say, well, I want, I want the new people to be able to do stuff, so I'll just lay out. No, no, no. There's plenty of work to go around. There's plenty of service to go around. You can keep faithfully serving God while teaching and training the next generation to do the same. We've got to stay faithful. Joshua was concerned rightly. He challenged them uh, very well. And then he ends his life and he makes a covenant with them. And I think tonight it would do us all well as we leave tonight to say, I'm going to make a covenant with God tonight. Uh, he's been faithful. He's fulfilling and my final, my final act here, here as a Christian is this. I'm going to keep staying faithful to God until he calls me home. And I'm going to teach as many people as I can along that journey to, to be faithful to God and to serve him with his life. Joshua, thrilling example. As he, as he passes off the scene, he gives us some great instruction right at the end of his life uh, through these two chapters here in chapter 23 and chapter 24. We'll all pass off the scene sometime. Somebody, hopefully, will be prepared to take our place. And uh, let's stay faithful to God until he takes us home. Amen? Amen. We see that from Joshua's life. Now, next, uh, just, so you're, just so you're aware, the next few Sunday evenings, uh, we will have guest speakers uh, with our missions that will be in, in here. Uh, so my dad will be preaching next Sunday night. Uh, and um, we'll have somebody the next Sunday. And then the walkers will be here the next Sunday. And so we won't have our regular listening to me okay uh so because of that we're not starting another series yet uh then we have a couple weeks and then we're off for easter and so I, i'm not going to start a series or anything in between that and mix and bounce around that type of thing however coming back april the first sunday of april uh we're gonna we're gonna delve into the topic of real christianity uh and we're gonna look at moving from just what people call religion to a real relationship and i want to look at we're going to spend some time looking at uh, what the world thinks the problems with Christianity are, uh, how we can truly be a genuine Christian. And, and I think it'll really be, if nothing else, it may not be exciting, but I promise you it will be challenging. And if you're looking to be a better Christian, uh, we'll start that series on Sunday nights, and I think it'll help every one of us uh, to be a better Christian for Christ and to be what the world would look at and say, that's a real, you know, they see enough, they see enough fake Christianity. Amen. And that's why when you invite people to church, what do they say? There's hypocrites. Fake Christianity. How do we make it real? I'm not, and again, I'm not talking a label. I'm not talking a name. I'm talking about a heart. What does it look like to be a real Christian? So we'll look at that uh, starting in April. So I'm getting excited about that. I think it'll be a good, a good time of teaching through that. So we have our blanks filled in tonight. Yes? Praise the Lord. Even Alice got them. All right. Amen. All right, let's pray. 
and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you again for your goodness, your blessings, your watch care in our life. Thank you for all that you do. You truly are a good God. Uh, you truly have been faithful. And Lord, we know that you bless us when we simply are obedient. And Lord, may we be reminded from these truths that are brought out from Joshua to Israel, uh, the, the, the faithfulness of God we need to remember so that we continue to serve you. That ought to motivate us. Help us to remember the chasing of God when we disobey. Help us, to Lord, to be challenged tonight to consider these things we've mentioned. Uh, help us to consider these things so that we have a better relationship with you, so that we stay faithful, and so that we teach a generation, not just through our words, but through our lives, uh, what faithfulness to Christ really looks like. And, Lord, may we reach the next generation and impact them uh, to be servants of Christ, Lord, we pray. We thank you again for now tonight. We thank you. Ask you as we uh, go to our homes uh, that you will give us safety as we travel. And uh, bring us back again on Wednesday, Lord, as we open your word. And we, uh, we pray, Lord, and we meet together. We just pray that you'll bless our service. And help us to live for you now this week and shine our lights. And, and share the gospel and the good news of Christ with people that we meet, we pray. We thank you again for, for this night. We thank you for all that you do. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.